Assalamu alaikum, brothers and sisters, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'd like to welcome you all to our weekly tafsir of Surah Al Anbiya. Alhamdulillah, we've come pretty far. We've reached uh, verse number 83, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, A'udhu billahi min ash shaytanir rajeem, Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. وَأَيُّوبَ إِذْ نَادَى رَبَّهُ أَنِّي مَسَّنِيَ الضُّرُّ وَأَنْتَ أَرْحَمُ الرَّاحِمِينَ And remember Job when he cried out to his Lord, Truly affliction has befallen me, and you are the most merciful of the merciful. Continuing the conversation about past prophets, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here, after speaking about Dawood and Sulaiman and the trials that they faced were unique in, in the sense that Dawood and Sulaiman represent what Allah expects when people are in power, how one is to conduct themselves when they are in positions of power. And you see that in the life of the Prophet the Prophet, especially in Medina, he was the head of state. So in the same way that Dawood and Sulaiman were the heads of a government, Rasulullah we see a parallel in his life. In Medina, he was also the ruler. He was also a head of state. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the verses that we will cover, he also gives examples of, of how he wants us to conduct ourselves in times of tribulation. So if Medina was a period where Allah tested the Prophet in terms of the power that he was given, the Meccan period was a period of patience. It was a period of great tribulation. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he begins a conversation about prophets who exhibited great patience. And this will be referenced uh, in, the, uh, in the next couple of verses. Now, because Ayyub alayhi salam has become the symbol of patience, the conversation about how to conduct yourself in the face of great tribulation begins with, Ayyub alayhi salam. Now, who was Ayyub? Now, Ayyub alayhi salam, when you look at the historical accounts that we have, he was the great, great grandson of Ishaq. So he comes from the line of Isaac. So he's a prophet from Bani Israel. Ayyub alayhi salam was also very fortunate in that he was married to a very pious woman, a very devout woman, a very God-fearing woman. His wife was Rahma. His wife, her name was Rahma. And incidentally, she was the, the granddaughter of Yusuf. And the, the hadith mentioned that, you know, she inherited the physical attractiveness of her grandfather. So Ayyub is the great, great grandson of Ishaq. He's married to Rahma, who is the granddaughter of Prophet Yusuf. So it's a very, very holy, very uh, a blessed family. Now, Ayyub and Rahma, they married, they had many children. And Ayyub alayhi salam lived a very comfortable life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestowed upon him great wealth. He had many children. He had over a dozen children, boys and sons and daughters. He lived in a spacious home. He owned a lot of land. He had a lot of cattle. So he was, he was very wealthy. So he was spiritually and materialistically very rich. And he lived this way for 73 years. So 73 years he enjoyed all of these material blessings and 
he had what, you, what we would call a picture perfect family. You know, he's married to the, the granddaughter of Yusuf alayhi salam. He has healthy children. He has all of this wealth at his disposal. He's very respected by his, uh, his people. He wasn't mocked and berated and ridiculed like other prophets. So he was respected, he had wealth, he was healthy, he had children, he had a beautiful family. And, you know, despite all of this, he was very humble. He was, he was very grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, there are many of us, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showers us with blessings, we become heedless. We fall into a state of ghafla. And with most people, they, they become mindful of Allah during times of difficulty and hardship. But Ayyub alayhi salam, even though he was surrounded by all of these blessings, he was always engaged in worship. He was always connected to Allah. He was always in a state of dhikr. Now the narrations mention that Iblis, that shaitan, actually became deeply jealous of uh, of Ayyub. Ayyub alayhi salam was praised by the angels and this bothered Iblis. And he essentially says to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you know why 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 are why are you so impressed with Ayyub? All of the angels they celebrate his praise, they compliment him they boast about him. What's so special about, about Ayyub? Allah, the Iblis, he says, Ilahi, O oh my Lord, you have not tested him through tribulation. Of course, Ayyub is going to be grateful. Of course, he's going to offer thanks. Because you've given him so much. He lives a comfortable life. Iblis then says, I swear if you were to try him with tribulation, if you were to make him taste bala, if you make him taste calamities, you would find him to be contrary to what, you, what he now appears. So shaitan says, my Lord, test him and you'll see that he is not as grateful as you think, that his real, his real nature will surface. So shaitan asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, grant me dominion over his wealth. Take away his wealth and you'll see that he will cease to offer you gratitude. He won't remember you in the same way that he was remembering you before. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants him control over his, his wealth, of his property. And the narration say that there was a massive fire that consumed his crops. It burned down his orchards. His cattle all perished. So overnight, overnight, he loses everything. He had all of this wealth. And then in an instant, he, lo he loses everything. Now, when this happens... You know, people came and they offered their condolences to him. They were shocked. And his response was that this was not my wealth, that it belonged to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was God's. It didn't belong to me. So he didn't, he wasn't grief stricken. All of the all of the money, all of his wealth vanished. He said it wasn't mine to begin with. It belongs to Allah and the rightful owner, the true owner, took it back. So alhamdulillah, he continued to offer gratitude, to offer shuk. So then shaitan says that, you know, maybe, maybe wealth is not his pressure point. So shaitan asks for dominion over his home and his his children, you know, there are some people, they don't care if they lose money, if they, if they, if their wealth vanishes, as long as their 
their family is healthy, as long as their family is protected. So shaitan, Allah grants him dominion over his, his children, the, the well-being of his children. And narrations say that his house collapses. It caves in on itself. The roof collapses. And his children, can you imagine? You know, Ayyub is a father. He has the same affection that any father would have towards his children. He loses all of his children. They get crushed under the debris. Their, their bodies are mutilated. And he loses all of his children. The only ones who remain is just him and his wife. Him and his wife, Rahma. All of the children die, tragically. Again, Ayyub, alayhi salam, he says that these children were an amana. They were a trust. Yes, I was their father, but I'm not their creator. They don't belong to me. Allah put them under my care for a period of time, and Allah has taken back his amana. So he was not, he continues to offer gratitude. Now, shaitan then asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for dominion over his body. And he says that surely, you know, yes, his wealth is gone, his children have passed away, but he's healthy. That's why he's grateful to you. But oh Allah, if you take away his health, surely he will reveal his ingratitude. That he will, he will stop praising you. What happens is, according to the narrations, and of course none of this is mentioned explicitly in the Qur'an. We know this from the ahadith of the Ahlul Bayt. What happens is that his body, especially his skin, lesions and blisters and boils appear all over his skin, covering him from head to toe. His skin was literally beginning to rot. And <clears throat> At this point, what was, what was so painful to Ayyub was that people were so repulsed by his condition that him and his wife, they had, to, they had to leave the city. They had to move to the outskirts of the city. And, you know, they, they had no money. Their children had passed away. Rahma, the wife of Ayyub, she has to start working. So this is, the, you know, the, let me, can you imagine this? The, this is the, the granddaughter of Yusuf. Yusuf was ruling Egypt. Now his granddaughter has to work and clean homes to bring some money home to purchase some bread and some simple food for her and her husband. You know, this is the nature of this dunya, brothers and sisters. You know, some days, you know, you have wealth and you have all of these uh, blessings at your disposal. And, you know, in an instant, they can be taken away. As Allah says, وَتِلْكَ الْأَيَّامِ نُدَاوِلُهَا بَيْنَ النَّاسِ that These are the days Allah distributes them among the people. Some days are good, some days are bad. You have times of, you know, ease, times of difficulty. In any case, she begins working. And this was obviously very difficult for, for Ayyub. You know, his wife is a very attractive woman. You know, he is, he has always been the primary breadwinner. And now he's not able to provide. His wife has to work day and night to bring home food. They're living in, in what we would call a dump in the outskirts of town. Ayyub is by himself. And one narration says that some of the companions of Ayyub, they venture out, you know, some of them were uh, used to hide out in the mountains and they used to meditate. They go and they locate the residence of Ayyub and they come to him and they say that, oh Ayyub, we always thought highly of you. You are such an honorable, a very righteous man. But surely God must be punishing you. 
doesn't make sense that all of these bad things are happening to you for no reason. Surely you must have committed a sin that we don't know about, that we don't know about. So what did you do that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided to unleash his wrath upon you? Now, when Ayyub alayhi salam, when he heard this, you know, these were his closest companions. When they started to be, when they started to be suspicious of the righteousness and the piety of Ayyub, this was, this was very difficult for him to bear. And you see that, you know, as the days go by, and even his, his wife starts to get affected, he turns to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It reached a point where the suffering and the hardships became unbearable for Ayyub. For seven years, this was his condition. And then he raises his hands in dua. And then Allah mentions the dua that he made seven years after enduring this type of hardship. What does he say? وَأَيُّوبَ إِذْ نَادَى إِذْ نَادَى رَبَّ And remember when Job and remember Job when he cried out نَادَى You know there's there's even a sense of, of desperation in the ayah that he called out it was not a whispered prayer he cried out to his Lord sitting alone his wife is working day and night his body is is uh is uh, decomposing, he's suffering, he's in pain, he's lost the respect of his companions. Life is very difficult for him. But look at the adab. Look at how he calls upon Allah. Allahu Akbar. He says, Oh my Lord, affliction has touched me. The word dhur refers to a physical ailment. And the word mess, it refers to a light touch. After seven years of trial and tribulation, after, after losing his wealth, his children, after suffering this horrible disease, he says, oh Allah, some difficulties have touched me. Messani al-dhuq. A little bit of difficulty has touched me. You know, brothers and sisters, this is really a, a, a point for us to, to reflect on. That all of this, Ayyub says, and that a little bit of hardship has afflicted me. You know, you and I, if we if we don't get that promotion, or if we get sick, or if something doesn't go according to plan, or if you know, I'm going on ziyara and my flight is delayed. We consider this such a big deal and we make a big commotion and we complain and we whine and we act as though the world is ending. Ayyub, so much, so poised, so composed in his dua with the utmost etiquette. He says, oh Allah, a little bit of hardship, affliction has touched me. And nimassani al and you are the most merciful of those who are capable of mercy. You know, usually when people are suffering, they ask, where is God? Where is God's mercy? You know, that's why a lot of many people, they reject the existence of God because they cannot reconcile human suffering with divine mercy. Here, Ayyub is suffering, but he still recognizes that Allah is Arham Rahim. That everything that's happening to me, even though I might not understand it, is a manifestation of his mercy, that God is trying to elevate me. He wants me to, to develop certain virtues that can only be developed through hardship. And he doesn't even ask for relief. He doesn't say, oh my Lord, relieve me, cure me. All he says is that I'm suffering a little bit and you are the most merciful. I leave it up to you. He doesn't complain to anyone but Allah. And there's nothing wrong, and this shows that there's nothing wrong with complaining to Allah. That Allah, you should converse with Allah as though He is the closest friend. Even if you want to vent to Him, you don't necessarily have to ask Him for anything. Talk to Him. 
Ayub, Ayub didn't ask Allah for anything. He just said, oh Allah, I'm suffering and you are the most merciful. There was no su'al, there was no explicit request. He's conversing with Allah. So he complains to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is exactly what his, his forefather Ya'qub did when he was separated from Yusuf in Surah Yusuf, Surah number 12, Ayah number 86. That I I complain of my my sorrow and my grief to Allah, that this is the, the sunnah of prophets, that they don't complain about their misfortunes and their difficulties to other people. They complain to Allah. They have this type of relationship with Allah. So he makes this dua. So Ayyub makes this dua in ayah number 84. Allah says, Fastajabna lahu. So we answered him, فَكَشَفْنَا مَا بِهِ مِنْ ضُرْ And removed affliction, the affliction that was upon him. وَآتَيْنَاهُ وَأَهْلَهُ وَمِثْلَهُمْ مَعَهُمْ رَحْمَةً مِنْ عِنْدِنَا وَذِكْرَى لِلْعَابِدِينَ So we answered him and removed the affliction that was upon him and we gave him his family and the like of them along with them as a mercy from us and a reminder to the worshipers. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, according to this ayah and according to ahadith, that he, he actually resurrects the family, the children that he lost, and he gives them double the children. So some say that their children were restored, Allah revived his children, and he was also given grandchildren so his family doubled and this is allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy towards him and this is a reminder this is a reminder to the worshipers that sometimes in life you're going to go through difficulties but some way allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to show you his mercy you know the idea of you know with every hardship, there is ease. Surely with every hardship, there is ease. So worshipers will be tested. So it's so as a mu'min, as a believer, you should not be shaken up if you go through hard times. There's a hadith from Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam where he says, Inna ashadda nasi bala'an al-anbiya. Those who experience the most severe tribulations are prophets. And then second, those who experience the second most difficult tribulations are those who are close to them in rank. And then those who follow them in degrees of excellence. So there is a direct so there's a direct relationship between the amount of challenges that you face in life and your degree of iman. So the higher you are, the closer you are to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, naturally your tests are going to be more difficult. Your trials are going to be more bitter. That the, the challenges, challenges that you will face are going to be much more difficult. And then Allah says in ayah number 85, And remember Ishmael, Idris, and Dhul Kif, each was among the patient. So these are prophets who are described as having the quality of Sabr. So Ayyub was mentioned really as the as the icon of patience in the Quran. And then Allah mentions three prophets in this verse. Ismail, Idris, and Dhul Kif. Now, who is this Ismail that is mentioned here? Now, if you look at the Sunni commentaries of the Quran, many Sunni Mufassireen, they'll say that this is a reference to Ismail, the son of Ibrahim. However, Ahlul Bayt, they say that this Ismail is not the son of 
Ibrahim. But rather, this Ismail is the fourth successor of Musa. So you have Musa. The Wasi of Musa was Yusha ibn Nun, Joshua. The Wasi of Yusha of Joshua was Caleb or Caleb. The Wasi of Caleb was Hizqil or Ezekiel. And then the son of Hizqil was Ismail, which is this prophet that is mentioned here. Now, we don't know very much about Ismail ibn Hizqil, but obviously, according to this verse, he was very well, he had tremendous patience. And in Surah Maryam, Surah number 19, ayah number 54, there is a title that is given to him. وَذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ إِسْمَعِيلِ إِنَّهُ كَانَ صَادِقَ الْوَعْدِ وَكَانَ رَسُولَ النَّبِيَّ That this Ismail, son of Hizqil, Allah calls him صَادِقَ الْوَعْدِ The one who keeps his promise. So you look how, how important this quality is. You know, maintaining and uh, fulfilling your, your promises that Allah praises him for this quality. And narrations mention that there was an individual that wanted to meet with him at a certain place, but the, the guy never showed up. And because Hizqil made a promise to him that I will meet you at this specific place, every day for about a year or a very long period of time, he would go at that appointed time and just check to see if the man had come. Until maybe after a year passed, that man sees Ismail ibn Hizqil and he says that I completely forgot about you know, my appointment with you. And he was so impressed by the fact that when Ismail ibn Hizqil made that promise, he held himself to that promise for an entire year. He would go and just make sure that that man did not come at that appointed time. So... This is with uh, respect to, uh, to Ismail. Now, Idris is also mentioned here. Wadhkur. Wa Ismail wa Idris. Now, Idris, now again, these prophets are not mentioned in, uh, in chronological order. Again, the Quran is not a, a book of history. Idris definitely predates. Ismail ibn Hizqil. In fact, Idris, he's one of the, the prophets of God, and he's actually the great grandfather of Nuh. Idris. And we have a hadith from Imam al Sadiq where he says, Innama summiya Idris li kathrati dirasatihi al kutub. You know, Idris used to read a lot, you know. So because he used to study and read, the divine scriptures that was re that were revealed to him, uh, he he uh, he was given the name uh, Idris, which comes from the word darasa, which means to study. Now, so Idris is mentioned, and then the Kif. Now, unfortunately, we know very very little about the Kif, and the Kif seems to be a title that was given to this uh, prophet. He's mentioned two times in the Quran. And we have a narration from Imam al-Jawad, our ninth Imam. He says that, that Dhil Kif was actually a prophet who was among the 313 messengers. So he was also a Rasul. So we have 124,000 prophets 313 among them were rusul they were messengers and the kifl was one of the messengers now there's a prophet that's mentioned uh, by the name of al-yasa al-yasa was a prophet and the ahadith mentioned that the kifl was actually the successor of al-yasa or elisha as it's mentioned in the Bible. Now, 
Eliasa or Elisha, he was a prophet who was old, and he when he was on his deathbed, he wanted to to see his wasi manage the affairs of the community in front of his eyes. So he basically addresses his community and he says, whoever accepts three challenges from me shall be my successor. You know, it's very similar to the prophet in Da'wad Dhul Ashir at the beginning of the mission where he says, whoever, who, who among you, O Bani Hashim, is willing to help me and whoever helps me now and supports me, he will be my my brother and my supporter and my successor. Similarly, Eliasa makes a similar offer and he says that whoever accepts my challenge will be my wasi. And his challenge was, is that you must fast every day, you must spend every night in worship and you, you must always control your anger. And none other than the kif accepted that uh, that challenge and he became the uh, the wasi of uh, al-yasa and then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says all of them were among the patient ones and this shows us brothers and sisters how important it is for us to develop the quality of patience of sabr that these are prophets that were that exhibited this quality to the highest level. So if we want to associate ourselves with MBA, if we want to be pro prophetic in our conduct, we have to be people of sabr. That you know the ahadith say that the the relation of patience to iman is like the relation of the head to the body. The body cannot function without a head. And similarly, similarly, faith, iman, is useless unless someone has patience, unless someone has sab. I number 86, And we caused them to enter our mercy. Truly, they are among the righteous. We cause them to enter our mercy, could be a reference to paradise or the, the uh, Jannatul Barzakh, the paradise in, uh, in Barzakh. And, they, and the reason why we did this, the reason why we rewarded them and we exposed them to our special mercy is because they were Salihin. They were righteous. They were always looking for opportunities to do good. They were people of action. The problem with you and I, brothers and sisters, we're, we're people of just talk. We talk a lot. We need to be people of action. We need to be people who, who, who strive, who make an effort to do good, who look for opportunities to do good. You know, in the same way that there are people that are always looking for investment opportunities, we have to look for spiritual investment opportunities, opportunities to invest in our akhirah, to be among the salihin. And then verse number 87, Allah mentions another prophet. And remember the noon. Now, noon is it means a large fish or a whale. So, and remember the noon, remember the companion of the fish or the companion of the whale. When he went away in anger and thought we would not constrain him. Then he cried out in the darkness, There is no God but you. Glory be to you. Truly, I have been among the wrongdoers. Now, then, noon is a reference to Prophet Yunus or Prophet Jonah, as, uh, as his name appears in the, in the Bible, in the, uh, the Old Testament. Now, 
Yunus السلام, was sent to preach to the people of Nainawa. You know, so Yunus ibn Matta is his full name. He was sent to the people of Nainawa, which is close to the, uh, the area of Mosul today in Iraq. And of course, just like we find with every community, his, his people, they rebelled, they rejected. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had promised to send down punishment upon the people. So what happens, because Allah says that I'm going to punish them, Yunus السلام, felt justified in leaving his people. So he figured that Adab is going to, these people are going to be punished by God. My job is done. So he leaves. He leaves Nainawa when he should have been patient and awaited God's command. So he assumed that he was allowed to leave. But what would have been better for uh, Yunus would have been to wait for Allah's command, just like with Lut, that you know Allah Subhanahu wa Taala gives him permission that your job is done, that you you're not allowed to make you know unilateral decisions. Your mission ends when Allah says your mission ends. So because he he left, and he, he felt justified in leaving, he assumed that because punishment is going to descend. That I leave, that I have, that these people are useless. My mission is finished. Now, when he does this, of course, he falls below. Now, of course, he didn't commit a legal sin. There was no haram that was committed, but he did something that fell below the divine, the high divine standard that Allah sets for his prophets. So then Nuni and he left angrily. He was he was angered by his people because of their insolence and their rebelliousness. And he left because he did not he did not think that Allah would constrain him and want him to stay with his community, especially after God had decreed that they are deserving of punishment. And then, as you all know, he ends up. He's overthrown. He he falls out of uh, the ship that he's in. He's consumed by a massive fish or a massive whale. And Allah says, "Fanada fubudamat." He realizes that he was too hasty. That his that his anger was uh, that he was too hasty in giving up on his community. Fanada from Volumat, he called out in darkness. Now, Volumat is plural. So the narrations say that there were layers of darkness. So he was inside of the belly of the whale. So the darkness of the belly of the whale. And then you have the darkness of the ocean water, the water, the darkness of the sea. And then you have the darkness of the night. So there are layers of darkness. So he's, he's inside. And can you imagine being in that, you know, terrifying situation? What does he do? There is no God but you. There is no refuge but you. There is no place, place of peace or Comfort, there is no refuge except with you. La ilaha illa subhanaka, glory be to you. Inni kuntu min al I wronged myself. I was too hasty. I should have waited for your command before I left my community. Fanada fulbulumati and la ilaha illa and subhanaka inni kuntu min al And you notice that Yunus السلام, he doesn't say, oh Allah, it's, he doesn't make excuses. He doesn't make excuses for his actions. He doesn't say, oh Allah, they were wicked, they were evil people, they were corrupt. He points the finger at himself. La ilaha illa ant, subhanaka inni kuntu min 
You know, even when prophets don't commit sins, when they just do something that is slightly, that is slightly beneath what Allah expects, they cry to him. They say that we've wronged ourselves. We are valimin. We've wronged our souls. You know, some of us, we commit major sins and we don't even call upon Allah with this, with this sense of regret and remorse. And then Allah says, فَاسْتَجَبْنَا لَهُ وَنَجَّيْنَاهُ مِنَ الْغَمِّ وَكَذَلِكَ نُنْجِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ So we answered him and saved him from grief. وَنَجَّيْنَاهُ مِنَ الْغَمِّ غَم means grief. It's that heaviness that you feel in the heart. وَكَذَلِكَ نُنْجِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Allah here, it's very beautiful at the end of this ayah. Allah says, وَكَذَلِكَ نُنْجِلْ مُؤْمِنِينَ This is how we save the believers. That's why Allama Tawa Tawa'i, he says that this, this, is, this dua of Yunus, dua ul Yunusi, is something that we should regularly, regularly recite. If you have grief in your heart, if your heart feels heavy, if you feel sorrow, if you have ghem, if you have ghem, you should make this dua. This dua is therapeutic. Allah says, We saved him from grief. And this is a dua that is not only effective for Yunus. This dua, if it's recited sincerely, with sincerity, Allah says, I will remove ghem from your heart if you recite this dua. So this is one of the secrets of the Quran that if you are if you find yourself in darkness you know metaphorically speaking if you find yourself in a dark place in your life if you feel hopeless if you feel you know if you feel like there's no way out if you find yourself between a rock and a hard place as they say if you're filled with grief say make the same dua as Yunus la ilaha illa ant and repeat it. Go down into sujood and repeat it. Now, before we uh, we conclude, I just wanted to share just a pers personal story about the uh, the dua of uh, of Ayub. And we really have to cherish these duas that we find in the Quran. These are the duas of prophets. The du'as that are mentioned in the Qur'an, we have to really cherish them. Allah makes it a point to mention the du'a of Ayyub, the du'a of Yunus. These du'as are powerful. They're very effective. And just, you know, just to share a personal story with you about the du'a of, uh, of Yunus. When my, uh, my grandfather, who passed away uh, about four years ago, when I, was, uh, when I was a little kid, I think I was maybe a toddler at the time, he actually had a very bad injury. It was during the winter time, and he slipped on a sheet of ice. He was shoveling the driveway, and he fell on his head, and he went unconscious, and he went into a coma. And he was hospitalized, and uh, he was completely uh, paralyzed. And... When I when I grew up when I grew later grew up, my grandfather told me that he uh, when he regained consciousness and he found himself completely paralyzed, he says that I have forgot his he lost his memory, and the only verse of the Quran that he was able to remember was the du'a of a you. So he said that I wasn't able to communicate with anyone around me. I couldn't communicate with the nurses, with any family, any friends. So I just laid, you know, when I was awake, he says, I would just, I would only, I was, I, I thought that I was going to be paralyzed all my life. And I was so sad and so hopeless that I would just repeat the dua of because he says I, I, he didn't even know what was wrong with him he says I, I just realized that I couldn't move and I asked Allah oh Allah truly affliction 
has befallen me and you are the most merciful of the merciful. And he, he said that after a few weeks, I regained energy and my paralysis was completely reversed through the barakah of, uh, of this dua. So when you come across an ayah in the Quran where Allah is teaching us a dua, either directly or through the story of a prophet, try to memorize that dua and incorporate these du'as in your qunut and in your uh, supplications. So with that, inshallah, we'll uh, conclude there. وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد Any questions or comments? Uh, these are some two, two really interesting duas that came up here. I've got and and uh, it seems like bo both of these are kind of around uh, just different ways to respond to grief and, and loss. Exactly. I mean, you know, I, I think really that's the theme of these of these verses. You know, you have you have Dawood and Sulaiman who who respond to the great blessings that Allah had given them with gratitude, and then you have the example of you know Ayub and Yunus reacting to tribulation with patience. So in times of uh, tribulation, you have to display sab. In times of ni'mah and ease, you have to display shuk. And you see, again, for me, the contrast between the, uh, the story of Dawood and Sulaiman and the story of, of Ayyub and Yunus is like the, the Meccan period and the Medani period in the life of the Prophet, you see that the Prophet endured, you know, uh, almost all of these tragedies and these calamities that previous prophets experienced, and he also enjoyed that uh, that political authority that that some prophets enjoyed before him. But yes, I mean, it's it's a, it's an important reminder that when when you go through tribulation, you have to observe patience. And you, you, have to, you have to continue to maintain your relationship with Allah. That you still have to make dua, you, you, you communicate with Him. That your connection with Allah should never be interrupted, whether it's during the times of ease or the times of difficulty and hardship. Uh, one question. Um, it, uh, this question is about the translation of uh, the dua in Ayah 83. Uh, the translation, uh, some of these Muhammad that the, the translation says, Ayub cried to Allah, truly distressed has seized me. Uh, and this translation say, implies that it's more than just a small grief. Is the translation inaccurate? So, Abdur in the Arabic language means a physical, uh, physical ailment, a physical affliction. The word messani seems to indicate, and some some mufassirin they, they argue this that that he doesn't he doesn't over complain about his uh, his uh, his calamity because we all know that all prophets were informed about what was to befall Rasulullah Ahlul Bayt and Imam Al Hussein. So you know perhaps many of them felt too embarrassed to magnify. Their uh, their hardship. So Ayub uses mess any of them. Mess is a very light touch. That you know the that these are severe calamities, but it's almost like a severe calamity is like this external thing that has just barely touched me. And when when a severe calamity barely touches me, you know this is you know this is what I go through. So obviously what Ayub endured, you know, relative to what we experience is a great musibah. It's a great tribulation. But relative 
for example, to what Imam al Hussein السلام, had to endure, then yeah, it's it's a small little touch of difficulty. So that's the beauty of the ayah. It's you know, so Dhur is you know, uh, it's it's a heavy calamity. There's no doubt, but it also has the uh, it conveys the idea of messing. It's a light touch. And uh, related to this, uh, when uh, the verse of the Quran that says people aren't given any burden greater than what they can bear, uh, how, how do we interpret this in face of things like uh, the different trials people face today that are seem extremely great, like human trafficking and other depression and other things that seem like uh, it is a much greater trial. I think we have to make a distinction between people uh, failing to, to pass the, the test that they're given and people just not having the ability to, uh, to bear it. You know, sometimes we fail not because we don't have the capacity, it's because we've chosen to, to lose hope or because of the weakness of, uh, of our faith. But nothing, nothing happens to us unless we have the, we have the capacity. So the potential to, to endure is there. So Allah never puts you through a circumstance that is humanly impossible for you to, uh, to endure. So the, the potential of overcoming is there. Some people, for whatever reason, they fail to, uh, to realize their, uh, their full potential. And uh, do you know uh, why, why do we not know more about Prophet uh, Zil Kifl? Uh, it seems unusual that he would be mentioned in the Quran without us knowing that much about his history. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, I know I looked at the, the hadith. There is very little uh, about him. It's, uh, yeah, we don't, uh, we don't really have that much about him. And I mean, the, the same also goes for, for Khil, you know, Musa and Khil. We don't really know very much about uh, but Allah gives us enough for us to uh, to achieve, uh, you know, the you know the objective, which is to draw close to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So we so we don't yeah we don't have a lot about uh, uh, Ismail ibn Hizqid. We don't have a lot of information about uh, Dil Kif. Now, if you want some more details, you know, Sheikh Rudwan Arastu in his book God is God God's emissaries. He has you know a small chapter. In, uh, in his book on on these prophets but again you know even I, I even looked at uh, those chapters there's very little mention about them you know perhaps there was more uh, there was more hadith literature on them but you know with the passing of time some of these hadith may have been lost you know so uh, so we we make do with uh, with what we have so uh, the stories of Prophet Yunus and Prophet Lut seem very similar, um, which, uh, except there's a slight difference in decisions that they made. Uh, which of those prophets came first? Which story happened first? So, <clears throat> so Lut, Lut was a contemporary of Ibrahim. He was the maternal uh, cousin of Ibrahim. So Prophet Lut came before, uh, came before uh, Yunus. And I mean, obviously, one of the, the, the big differences is that Lut salam leaves uh, Sodom and Gomorrah by divine command, whereas Yunus leaves without, uh, without getting God's permission. Yunus returns to his people, so the, the people of, uh, of Nainawa, they made tawbah, and Allah accepted their tawbah, and Yunus returns to his people. He went back to his people. There were over 100,000 residents in, uh, in Nainawa. They made Toba, whereas the community of Lut, they were adamant and they were persistent in their sins. They refused to repent and they were annihilated. Um, and uh, going back to the previous question about um, difficult, difficulty that one can bear. 
Just a comment that uh, the Jordanian pilot who was burned alive, he was troubled more than he could handle. How does this fit with the Quranic statement? Say that again, the, jo the Jordanian who? Uh, some, some Jordanian pilot who was burnt alive, uh, he was troubled more than he could handle by that event. And how does this fit with the Quranic ayat? So, so he burned himself alive. Uh, I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I don't know about that incident in detail. But uh, as I said, you know, if someone commits suicide, that doesn't mean that you know Allah gave them, you know, uh, he gave them a, a burden that they just couldn't bear. They, they, you know, they made a decision to. Uh, to end, their, to end their life. So it, we could say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives, everyone has the capacity. They have the potential to, uh, to pass uh, the trials that they're given. But if they choose not to, that's, that's their own decision. It's kind of like when, a, when an instructor, when a, your teacher gives you an exam, when a professor gives you an exam and, and, you, fail, and you fail the exam. Now, just because you, you studied and you still failed, that doesn't mean that you didn't have the capacity to pass. You just, for whatever reason, you failed that exam. So a person's failure to succeed, to pass a divine trial, does not indicate that the trial was, was beyond their capacity. It just means that they, they failed the trial. Okay, uh, just a little bit of clarification on this question. Now, it, it seems like... Uh... This, this is generally speaking, this is about if somebody is subjected to more pain than they can burn, take, like torture, for example. So in this case, he was burnt by other, by ISIS. So, so again, you know, when, uh, so, so the question is, if someone uh, endures more pain that they can handle? R yes, because I guess the, the, the assumption here is that if somebody is burned to death, for example, or tortured to death, then they could not have handled that much pain. I mean, you, you, you could make the same argument about, uh, about any type of pain. That doesn't mean that, you know, a person dying as a result of pain does not, does not mean that Allah gave them a trial that they couldn't bear. It just means that their, their life ended and their life could have ended on Iman, that they were patient, but they physically couldn't endure. So, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعا doesn't mean that God is, is God is never going to put on uh, place upon you something that you physically cannot endure. You know, people die all the time. You know, in many cases, death is because you're enduring something that your body cannot handle. So, enduring it in the religious sense, meaning that you fulfill your religious responsibility. So, everyone has the potential to fulfill their religious responsibility. So. Regardless of whatever circumstance Allah puts you through, if Allah puts you through a trial, you have the potential to fulfill your religious responsibility in that situation. You have the capacity. If you don't, that's on you. If you die as a result, that, that just means your, your, your life ended or you physically couldn't uh, bear that suffering. But that doesn't mean that Allah gave you a, a burden that you cannot bear. Because the burden here is, we're talking about the burden of fulfilling your religious responsibility. You could die in the middle of a, a trial, and you 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 would have you, you could have uh, passed uh, that divine test. You know, just like with Imam Hussein Hussain, his body could not physically endure any more suffering. But can we say that Allah placed on him a burden that he could not bear? No, he carried that burden, meaning he fulfilled. His religious obligation, whether his body could endure or not, that's a separate issue. Is that clear? Uh, that, that, that's a really interesting explanation because this is bearing in this case is, uh, is really kind of referring to spiritually bearing or, or not losing your spiritual ability or rank or status. Keeping, it's keeping about technique. When Allah says, لا يكلف نفسا إلا وسعا, Allah is not going to give you taklif that is beyond your, your, uh, your capacity. So the question is, it's about taklif. What is your religious duty in that uh, specific moment? So for example, imagine 
you know, God forbid someone is put in solitary confinement. Chances are you, you're not going to be able to endure that for more than a few weeks. You, you'll probably lose your mind or you could die of depression. The point is that in, while you're going through that trial, are you able to hold on to your iman? That's your taklif, to fulfill whatever your religious responsibility is, that you do your salah, that you maintain your faith in Allah. If you die, that doesn't mean that Allah gave you a burden that you could not bear. No, you, you fulfilled your taklif, but you died because your physical body could not handle that, uh, that trial. So you, you succeeded. It doesn't mean that Allah was unjust and he made you endure something that you couldn't handle. Oh, so, so, so the original word in this phrase is taklif. And are you saying that taklif is translated, like the more accurate translation for this may be responsibility? So, now you kallifu Allahu nafsan illa wasa. You kallifu is, is God does not, so burden, the meaning of burden that you'll find in the translation it's referring to a very specific type of burden, and that is the burden of religious obligation. Taklif, you know, taklif is, is something that is, is weighty. So, for example, your prayers, that, that's a weighty responsibility on your shoulders. Your, the obligation of you being just, being honest, fasting, being good to your parents, that's taklif. So Allah doesn't give you a taklif that you cannot bear. So yeah, burden so is very specific. It's not just talking about God is not going to put you through any anything that you can't bear because people die of things that they can't bear all the time. Okay, so, so, so another way to kind of translate this verse would be to say, hey, you're not given an obligation that is more than what you can fulfill. Exactly. Okay, yeah, cause this is, uh, I'd always interpreted this verse differently. Yeah, so it's it's referring to 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 your religious obligations that there, Allah would not ask. It's like Allah Subhanahu wa Taala would not command, would not obligate someone who's handicapped to to pray, offer their prayer standing. This person can only pray while they're sitting, or this person cannot fast the entire month of Ramadan. It's beyond their capacity. So that taklif is not on them. Well, uh, thank you very much. That was really, really interesting. And uh, thank you for this class. Yeah, this was a very, this, this class became extremely exciting, <laughs> especially I'm, the q and I'm glad you guys uh, enjoyed it. Uh, I'm going to, I don't think I'm going to be able to have cl conduct class next Wednesday. I'm actually going to be uh, uh, on my flight to, uh, to East Africa. They, 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 they say that I might, I'll, I'll have internet access, but I don't, I don't know how strong the internet connection will be. So for the following Wednesday, two weeks from now, I'll let you know if my connection is strong enough. And if it is, we'll, we'll have class. If not, then we'll have to resume when I return, inshallah. Okay, inshallah. Thank you very much, Sheikh. May Allah reward you for all your hard work and effort. May Allah bless you, inshallah. Please keep me in your du'as and may Allah reward all of you for your participation and you especially for, uh, for you know, leading uh, and organizing these sessions. May Allah bless you.